morning. I always, when somebody says, now we're going to have a, a short keynote, I'm always thinking to myself, I, I got married to a woman in Sweden. I lived up there for a quarter century and um, met her when I was there. And beautiful, tall Swedish woman. And one of the reasons she married me was because I'm a bit short. So that always works out. <laughs> I hope also to be sharp. Um, one of the things that, that interested me about today's um, forum is that we're really talking about uh, the medium of studio education, but we're talking about it uh, to and from several perspectives. So in, in addressing these issues, I'm going to have to jump back and forth just a little bit uh, to try and tease out some similarities as well as some differences. Um, the, the way I got into this is sort of interesting. Uh, as Graham said, I, I'm a participant in the group of artists known as Fluxus, but we're also designers, composers. We had a couple of architects among us. And one of the things that really led me to where I am today was a rather interesting question. One of the issues you frequently see in contemporary art activities is forms of art known as post-studio art or social practice. Uh, this kind of thing really interested me. How do you get some stuff done in the world that makes things work better? Now, in Herbert Simon's terms, which I didn't really know back then, this is design. How do you create a preferred future state as against a current state? Uh, so I found myself trying to deal with these issues in multiple ways, and frankly, uh, Nearly every artist I've ever known, and most of the designers I've ever known, don't really do very well at it. So I wound up going back to university to get a doctorate in leadership and human behavior, try and understand some of the tools and techniques one would use to actually address or create future states. Um, this leads to a crucial difference between what one might use a studio for in design and one what might use a studio for in art as well as the skills one needs both inside and outside the studio. Essentially, the, the crucial issue is kind of simple when you get down to education, uh, which is this. Studio education, studio training is about six or seven centuries old now. It goes back to the Artists and Craft Guild's tradition. And the Artists and Craft Guild, the studio tradition, in fact, is the contrary to everything we want to be and do in universities. Why? Because a studio is wrapped around a master. A master tends to be a god or a king or a lord in that studio and doesn't simply teach technique, although this is one of the ways you can use a studio, but the artisan craft guild tradition implies the master sets aesthetic premises, stylistic premises, and even how the apprentices may think. Whereas the university tradition, which is what I hope our studios are wrapped around goes back a couple of hundred years before that, actually a couple of thousand years, to the academies of ancient Athens, to the Socratic tradition, where we want to engage in analysis, rhetoric, and logic. Now, here comes the interesting issue, and this is where the experimental studio raises a question. That's only 20 minutes, so a lot of this gets jammed together rather rapidly, but the ancient Greeks did some marvelous stuff. They knew how, a great deal about how to think, but Greek science failed for an important reason. You had analysis, you had deductive logic, these did very well, but you had no way to test or find out if anything was so. You only looked at it and talked about it. Now, in the artisan studios, you had doing of things, but there was very little analysis or logic. Uh, in the Middle Ages, one of the ways we found out if a cathedral worked was if it simply stood up and didn't fall down. Uh, there is very little reporting, although those of you who read Henry Petrosky's books know that there's a great deal of evidence that an awful lot of stuff that architects and engineers built over the centuries fell down the first two or three times, and then they learned how to make it not fall down. Uh, and this would often repeat, cathedral after cathedral. Uh, so you need both sets of traditions, and you need a way to document and to record these traditions. And this brings us to where we are today. Now I want to put this in a bit of a frame. Uh, and in fact, a couple of the things Nancy was saying really uh, 
verged on one of the key issues that I believe is central. Everybody who goes to university, everybody who operates in today's world also has some kind of responsibility as a citizen, not as a member of a profession or of an interest group, simply as a citizen in a democracy where we all speak with each other. Thus, you have to link these sets of issues. Now, when you come to the question of the experimental studio, now you come up with two very different sets of problems, and I'm not quite sure how to address them in such a mixed audience. Uh, one problem is artists, as an artist, I invent a problem, I solve my problem, I say when I'm satisfied. Picasso used to say, others seek, I find. In other words, someone else is out there doing research, Picasso says, this is the problem, this is the answer. Now, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. Anybody who looks back over the art of the 20th century, you can see an awful lot of stuff that was highly praised at the moment, or at the time, looks a little strange to us now. How could anybody have thought that was interesting? In fact, how could I have thought that was interesting? And the really horrifying moment, of course, is when you look at your own old stuff from 30 years ago, and you're looking at this thing and say, my God, could I have ever been so silly? Not always, but not infrequently either. Designers do something else. Designers solve problems for legitimate problem owners. I've got a problem. I need to make this product work better. I need to get this work process or flow moving more effectively. You're a designer. I've come to you for help. Therefore, one set of issues requires research anchored in the real world. The other doesn't. Now we get to a problem that I see as genuinely serious in Australia. Uh, the language of research is being applied to something that I'm not sure you can always apply it to, and that's art. Nam Jun Paik used to say, artists don't do research, we just discover stuff. Now, in fact, to discover stuff, he actually had to do research, but that was technical research, mechanical research, historical research, but then he would just go out and do stuff, and this was his take on it. So we have a kind of a very odd dialectic where we have the poles of life, daily life on the one hand, invented life, which is art or design on the other, inquiry, and how do you navigate these? Now, uh, in one sense, we're really talking about two kinds of studios. One kind of studio is a site of one kind of creativity, which is to get in and wrestle with things until you're happy with the outcome. Now that outcome may look strange to anybody else. Uh, those of you who remember Alfred Jarry, the, the paterealist and pataphysicist, um, his, his, his last words were very interesting. He was lying on his deathbed and he called for a toothpick and he stuck the toothpick between the flesh of his thumb and the thumbnail and looked at it intensely for about a minute and said, ah, oh, and he died. Now, what could that mean? The answer is we don't know. If you're curious, if you're curious more about Jari, by the way, read Roger Shattuck's book, The Banquet Years, 50 years ago, still a classic, lots of fun. But the point is, he did some kind of experimentation for years and years and years leading up to his death, and at the end, something totally inexplicable to the rest of us. Whereas the focus that we take in a project like our new design factory is very intense, industry, brings us problems, or, or government brings us problems. We bring together a team of students and staff from engineering, from design, from IT, from business, and we put them to work on those problems. Now, our design factory is relatively young, but they've been doing this at Alta University in Helsinki for 30 years, and it's a very interesting process. It is so successful that every year, they get more companies who want projects done than they have student teams to go around. And these companies pay 15,000 euros to get a team. And the companies have to come and they make a pitch to the students and the lucky companies get students. And it's a tremendous process. Now it's also interesting because many companies know they're not gonna get an actual result that year. Even though they get a good answer out of the project, they're not gonna be able to use it or manufacture it. So the question is, why would a company pay 15,000 euros for this process, and often much more if it takes prototyping and other expenses that they also pay. Well, the answer is simple. If you have a company and you put eight or 10 of your own employees on it, you're paying their salaries for eight months or a year, it takes their time away from something else, much more expensive. If you pay 15,000 euros to a bunch of smart students, together with a couple of staff advisors, you get an answer, 
you learn something and that tells you about the next step. Now, no matter whether you're using your own employees or a group of students in a design factory, you learn something and what you may learn in both cases is this is the product of the future except we don't have the production lines, we don't have the manufacturing capacity, we don't have distribution chains. So all the things that you need to know you get out of both without a multi-million euro investment in something you still can't manufacture but you learn what you have to do next to start thinking and retooling. Now this is a very interesting and disciplined process and I noticed one of the workshops today will talk about this but one of the crucial issues of this is it's not a studio. It's actually a very different kind of process linking some studio skills to industrial engagement and research as well as to analysis, rhetoric, and logic. Uh, that doesn't mean that this doesn't take place in some of the entities we call studios, but we very clearly made our shift from what we called the design center, which was a studio, to the design factory model. Uh, there's us, there's one in Alto, there's one at Tongji University in Shanghai. We have a small alliance trying these new ways of working. Uh, so the question is, what are the issues we need to think about? Now one of the things, uh, and I know this is one reason why Graham brought me here, I, I, I really am Socratic, I'm a little bit blunt and plain spoken. Uh, I've always driven my Fluxus colleagues up the wall because I'd, I'd say, geez, this is a little odd, and I'd write an essay about it, and then Ben Voitier would explode and say, oh, it's one of these damn essays, Ken Friedman thinks he knows everything, ah! But it's really questions, good questions. And I had the interesting experience last week, I guess it was last week or the week before, AccuAds had the annual meeting, and my associate dean of research went, and she came back, and she was tearing her hair out about what she called the argy-bargy. And I'm saying, what, what was wrong? And she said, well, the problem is there are all these interesting, exciting, creative people, but they would make the most outrageous claims and put them forward as reasonable research conclusions. In other words, instead of starting with a speculative question, speculative question, and then they throw in some stuff from Foucault and Heidegger, and it's very clear they haven't really been reading their Foucault. She's a big Foucault expert. And all of a sudden, they're saying, okay, this, 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 therefore that, they haven't mastered the basics of logic. A problem I'm also having very often is uh, reading through job applications from people in the PhD programs of many of our Australian universities. Real basic research skills the kids don't have. How do you write a simple reference citation properly? Now frankly, back in Norway, we used to require that our first year students learn that. And I'm always disappointed. Now it wasn't always that way. When I got there we had to make a big shift. But the point is, you got a bunch of smart kids, you've got to give them thinking skills. So all these questions come together then at this moment in the 21st century, where we've got to be asking each other, what do we need to do to play a constructive and robust role in society? Uh, again, it was pointed out, this is a very expensive method of education and yet times are changing, we're re reinvestigating, we're looking at it, we're asking uh, what can we do to demonstrate to government, to industry, that in fact this is worth pursuing. My, my argument is, well, one of those key issues is to say first of all, everybody, us, our students, citizens, second, we're at university, this requires clear intellectual skills, third, master the basics of thinking. Now, one aspect of the Renaissance studio, which made it such a site of creativity and so powerful, was that in one particular era, for a while, we were talking about something more than the artist and craft guild tradition. We were talking about people who actually engaged in forms of serious experimentation, recording their results. It was kept proprietary, so it didn't always spread through the guild, but it was certainly the foundation of the studios that were great, made things work, to be able to ask questions in a rigorous, intellectually coherent way. Now, uh, one of the most interesting forgotten episodes in the history of modern science, if you look at the beginning of the Royal Society in the UK, who were the first members of the Royal Society? Well, okay, there were the wealthy patrons and nobles who got to be members sort of honorarily. They did a little experimentation in their spare time. But the rest of them were actually artisans, technologists, technicians, uh, people that we would today call designers, 
architects, artists, and they would write up their findings in a way that would be clear, comprehensible, easy to understand, easy to interrogate, crisp. And Richard Feynman, the Nobel laureate in physics, once said, if all of the documents of civilization were lost and you simply and only preserved the transactions of the Royal Society, you would be able to rebuild the entire scientific technological civilization. Now that's something pretty powerful. And that was people just like us. But it's very, very different. It was not people who grab a couple of words from Foucault and Heidegger and just go out and leap to conclusions. It was people who said, okay, I am taking the challenge of the experimental studio seriously. I'm going to interrogate the world. I'm going to speculate and create and add to it. I'm going to report my findings. Now, uh, as a sort of handout after the talk, there's something here that we've printed up. It's a book chapter from the Fluxus exhibition that's currently in New York. It was up at the Hood Museum at Dartmouth. The reason I put this forward is simple. You'll see that I talk about a very interesting issue. How do you have a laboratory of ideas? That is, an experimental studio. So it's really an apt title. We're talking about the same thing. There are mechanisms, mechanisms of writing, habits of mind, processes that bring these things to life. And now I am about two minutes from the end of the speech, so I'm not going to go into all of them. There is the article, but what I want to put forward as my contribution to the day is a really interesting challenge, which is if you can imagine a kind of a world where anybody who works in a studio is both a professional that is advancing the art of the profession, someone interested in his or her own career and in the careers of his or her colleagues, but at the same time, a citizen, someone creating value for society that belongs to everybody, inside the profession and outside, so that you fulfill the dual mission of the university, because all of our studios are in universities, and universities have these two missions, to advance knowledge and preserve knowledge. Well, there's a dialectic there, and yet it's a powerful dialectic because it keeps things going, and to create professionals while educating citizens. And again, there's a dialectic because, frankly, uh, as Adam Smith lost no time ever in pointing out, you get a bunch of professionals or tradesmen together, their job is to make as much money for themselves as they can, as against everybody else. Whereas in contrast, you get a group of citizens together, and our job is to take care of each other, even if it sometimes costs us something. So these two sets of dialectics, in my mind, are not only the engine of the university, they are the engine of the experimental studio. Thanks.